we made no reference to the 13th amendment provisions we set down what we thought was proper devolution of powers but now time has come when the president for the umpteenth time or fifth time says i will implement is threatening to implement the 13th amendment in full we must tell him you do that and show first you implement that and show set up the provincial police that is one matter for 25 years has not been implemented sri lanka has, is, is a country that shows a distinction for not implementing provisions of the law if not implementing provisions of the constitution and forever threatening to implement it and never doing so there was a 17th amendment to the constitution and which a constitutional council was set up and the words in that in that amendment was that president shall forthwith make the appointments and he did not make the appointments for two and a half years we went to court to compel him to make the appointment and failed that is sri lanka each president each uh, uh, member of parliament swears an oath to uphold and defend the constitution and in the same breath they will say no we will not set up the provincial police that's part of the constitution i think it is important from even from a rule of law perspective to hold the government to account to hold the government to hold the president to his word and say it's not something wonderful that you are offering to do what you are saying is that you will implement the, the provisions of the constitution that is a law that's a supreme law of the country it's it's not some benevolent thing that you are trying to do nevertheless if you say i will implement it in full do that and demonstrate your bona fides and i think the time has come for us back home and around the globe to act with a sense of strategy not given to emotionalisms too much because we have to have the world with us in this project we have to take the right thinking people of this world with us to support us take us forward to enable us to achieve our goals and so my appeal to you today is that when when the tna attempts to play that role we we, we would cover your support to us we would cover your understanding it is not that we have accepted the 13th amendment no we will publicly say that that is not meaningful devolution but even as a matter of strategy we must be in a position to to be able to tell the president well you are offering to implement the 13th amendment in full there is land power there are police power there are provision for merger there implement that in full and call his bluff by remaining silent because it is about the 13th amendment that we have rejected we are unable to call the bluff of the president there was a letter written to us about a month ago from a group of uh, persons calling themselves the tamil civil society in which they alleged that the tna had moved away from the sorry moved away from the ideals that we have laid down our principles and we are compromising why they said that i i still can't figure out but in that letter they cite 
two speeches as examples for saying that, for saying that we have moved away from our principles. One was an SJV Chermanayakar memorial oration delivered by me last year in April, uh, 26th of April in Kalambo. And the other is a statement, an appeal to the voters issued by Mr. Sapandan just prior to the Kalmana Municipal Council election. After that letter came to me, I read my own oration. I read Mr. Sambandan's statement and I can't figure out why they said that. So I called, not that I called, the first secretary to that letter called me about something else. Bishop Prayat Joseph. I say this publicly because I have spoken to him about this. And I asked him, Bishop, you have signed this letter. You cite as an example my lecture, uh, my, my, my memorial oration. Why do you say that? Have you read my mem memorial oration? He said, Illa I have not read that. How in the world did he sign a letter citing as an example that memorial oration? saying that that demonstrates that we have moved away from the ideas without even reading that ovation. I have counted at least 10 people in that list of secretaries who have not only read, not read that oration nor Mr. Sapatan's statement, they have not even read that letter they have signed and they have confessed that to us. We ought not to behave in such irresponsible manner. That's a letter that is released to the public. I am not saying this in order to attack them. I told the bishop that I will say this in public. Because we have to behave far more responsible than that. And then to counter that group, another group signs another letter and issues it. I don't know whether any of you saw that. Saying that open letter to the, to the civil and political leaders of the Tamil people. It seems like they have addressed it to that, the other the first form of group, uh, not necessarily to us. Now all this is being done in public. Of course we have used the first letter, we have showed that to the government, we are showing it to everybody else and saying well, if the DNA fails, then we will go out. But as, as a community, I am appealing to you that we need to be more circumspect. We need to strengthen the elected representatives and not weaken them. It's really not for me to be saying that to you. But sadly, the time has come to even throw that to you and say, what are you doing? I am not saying you, I am not you who, is, who are here, but I am saying in general. It is true that it's frustrating. It's more frustrating to us than, than for the others who, who, are not, who don't come for the negotiations. Many a time, we have felt like throwing the books at their faces and walking out. But we haven't done that. Only for the reason that we can't, we can't leave a vacuum. That there must be a process. And believe me, the Sri Lankan government will not deliver unless it is made to do that. And when it is made to do that, the elected representatives of the people must be there to clinch the deal as it were. And so it's a dual approach. While we apply pressure, we are also there with them. So that if there are any dividends of that pressure, then we are there to grab that. 
I believe until now that we can do all of this without publicly announcing to the world our strategy. But that doesn't seem to happen. That doesn't seem to work. So we have now come out in the public and we are saying it. And we want, we want the diaspora community to be patient. I know it's difficult. But for the sake of our people, we have to be patient. For the sake of our people, we have to act strategically, not emotionally. For the sake of our people, we must sustain the pressure and also be willing to negotiate at any stage. I thank you for this opportunity that you have given me to, to address you, bring the concerns from back home to you. And I am looking forward to greater participation. You also would have seen the re most recent statement issued by the Global Tamil uh, Forum. Stating that supporting the talks process that the DNA has with the government and we need to consolidate this more so that the strength of the diaspora community will be a political strength. I know it is already, but it needs to be demonstrated in a very real way to the world. Will be a political strength to our people back home who are still struggling to uh, get up, to stand up from what happened to them three years ago. We need that help and that will be converted to real strength when we act in unison, when we act with understanding, not necessarily saying the same thing. Strategically, we might have to say different things, but understanding each other and knowing that our goal is one. Thank you very much.